Bueno, es un gusto tener a tanta gente conectada. Nosotros estamos transmitiendo, como ustedes saben, por Zoom, por Facebook Live, por Instagram, por Periscope, en Twitter. Mi nombre es Aparicio Caicedo, soy director ejecutivo de Ecuador Libre. Y en Ecuador Libre hemos empezado una ronda de conferencias con grandes pensadores para reflexionar sobre esta crisis desde distintas perspectivas académicas, económica, filosófica, política y muchas otras. En colaboración con la Universidad de las Américas del Ecuador y la Fundación para el Progreso de Chile, eh, les queremos agradecer también a estas entidades por colaborar con nosotros, o sea, son muy importantes para la difusión de este evento. Y yo creo que esta ronda de conferencias no podría comenzar mejor que con Matt Ridley como conferencista. Matt Ridley es uno de los pensadores contemporáneos que creo más influyentes del mundo, con varios bestsellers, eh, libros como The Rational Optimist, The Evolution of Everything, Nature vs. Nurture, entre muchos otros. Eh, Matt ha sido corresponsal científico de la re revista The Economist y ahora se encuentra promocionando un libro que está por salir, que les traduzco el título, se llama ¿Cómo, la cómo funciona la innovación y por qué solo esta florece en entornos libres? Para Ridley, basado en evidencia científica profunda, la, clase, la clave de la prosperidad material y el bienestar humano es la promoción de un entorno que permita la innovación en todos los ámbitos. O dicho en palabras de él, nuestra cultura evoluciona positivamente cuando se permite que las ideas de millones de personas tengan sexo, como él dice, y se reproduzcan. Por eso, la única forma de salir de la crisis económica es fomentar un entorno que permita a las personas innovar en el campo de la ciencia, el comercio, las finanzas, la política y hasta el arte. Iremos recogiendo las preguntas que tengan ustedes y que las puedan escribir, ya sea en, WhatsApp, ya sea, perdón, en Facebook o desde donde estén, para que nuestro equipo las pueda hacer y, y transmitirlas para podérselas hacer a Matt luego de que termine su conferencia en los próximos 30 o 40 minutos. Ahora les voy a empezar en inglés, dado que nuestro invitado habla en inglés. It is a pleasure to have so many people connected. Ecuador Libre uh, have started a round of conference with great thinkers to reflect on this crisis from different academic perspectives, economic, philosophical, and political. I think we could not start uh, with a better person as Matt Ridley as a speaker. Matt Ridley is one of the most influential contemporary thinkers with several bestsellers such as The Rational Optimist, The Evolution of Everything, Nature versus Nurture, among others. He was also a scientific correspondent uh, for the, the Economist magazine, and now he's promoting his forthcoming book, How Innovation Works and Why It Only Flourishes in Free Environments. It is, an, it is in Amazon right now, you can reserve it. For Ridley, based on deep scientific evidence, the key to material prosperity and human well-being is the promotion of an envi environment that enables innovation in all areas. Our culture evolves posit positively when the ideas of millions of people are allowed, are allowed to have sex, as he says, and reproduce themselves. Therefore, the only way out of the economic crisis, crisis is to foster an environment that allows people to innovate in the fields of science, commerce, finance, politics, and even arts. So I let you with no more words with uh, Matt Ridley to begin with. Thanks Matt for being here. Thanks for being with, be with us. This means a lot for Ecuador, means a lot of, for Ecuador Libre and for people who is hearing you. Thank you Aparicio very much indeed for that kind introduction uh, and for the invitation. Uh, and it's really, really nice to be able to um, uh, join you uh, in Ecuador. I have been to Ecuador once, uh, to go to the Galapagos Islands uh, 10, 12 years ago, I think, and a uh, little time in Guayaquil, but I did not go uh, anywhere else. Um, I know what a very difficult time your country has been having anyway, and I know that it's even more difficult now because of this terrible pandemic, which is so problematic to uh, uh, so many countries, but particularly so for a country like Ecuador. Um, so, um, what I would like to do is I'm not going to talk very much about the virus, about the pandemic, uh, a little bit, uh, but I'm going to talk about innovation because I think innovation is the means by which we are going to solve this problem, means by which we're going to uh, defeat the virus and repair the economy, the economic uh, situation in all of the countries of the world affected by it. Um, 
Uh, and I'm interested in the question of what is innovation and why does it happen to human beings and where does it happen and how does it happen? Uh, and that's what this book tries to do. Um, so I would very happy to talk afterwards in the question and answer very specifically about the virus, about my views on diagnostic testing, development of vaccines, uh, the origin of the pandemic, why, whether why we were prepared or not prepared for it and all that kind of thing. But let me try and share some slides as I talk. Um, and I hope you can see that. And I will um, just click through them. But it's now not working. There we go. Um, so there is the epidemic um, up until um, uh, yesterday. Um, uh, over nearly 200,000 people have died already. Uh, this is an extraordinary episode which will uh, have an enormous impact on the world. It's not a very lethal disease. It has a low mortality rate, but it is so contagious, particularly in the asymptomatic uh, uh, including in asymptomatic people, that, that even with a low mortality rate, uh, case fatality rate, it is causing um, high mortality. Um, uh, and I think this may be hidden on the right-hand end of your screen, but this is supposed to show um, uh, the impact on the tourism economy, which I know is important to Ecuador. Um, the greatest fall projected for the global for world international tourism uh, ever uh, re ever expected and that is going to be truly terrible for many countries so it's quite helpful i think perhaps just for me to spend a little bit of time cheering you up because you're locked in your homes and you uh, are in a bad situation so let me remind you how the world has been getting better and will again be able to get better in the future if you ask people in a country like Britain or America, has the percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty, that is defined these days as $1.90 a day, doubled, halved, or stayed the same over 20 years, you tend to get an answer like this. And it has Hans Rosling who did this survey, 65% of people think it has doubled, a third think it has stayed the same, and very few, just 5%, think that the percentage of the world population living in extreme poverty has halved in that time. The 5% are right and the 65% are wrong. But what Hans Rosling realized was that if he wrote those three answers on three bananas and he threw them to a monkey, the monkey would pick up the right answer 33% of the time, not 5%. So it would do six times better than human beings at answering a question about human society which seems extraordinary. And of course, what this is telling us is that, as Josh Billings said, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure, which ain't so. Here are the numbers on poverty. When I was born, over half the world was still living in extreme poverty, corrected for inflation, and those numbers have gone down very, very sharply since to, uh, uh, less than 8% of the world now living on $1.90 a day. That is a very low level of poverty, and there are many poor people above that level. But this is extraordinary. No human generation has ever lived through an improvement in living standards comparable to this. And it has been accompanied, despite the predictions of economists like Robert Heilbronner in 1970, saying that the outlook is painful and desperate, uh, it has been accompanied by a reduction in misery. Child mortality is the the measure of the greatest mis misery I can think of. Nothing is to compare with having to bury a child. Uh, and look what has happened to child mortality. On all the continents, it has declined. There was a period when Africa was falling fast behind the rest of the world, but that was largely because of the HIV epidemic, and Africa is now catching up. Uh, again, I think you may not be able to see the labels, but Africa is the top line in that chart. Malaria the most lethal of the infectious diseases, was getting worse in the 1990s, killing more people, almost doubling the death toll. And in the, around the year 2000, there were many predictions that climate change would result in a huge increase in malaria in the 21st century and a huge increase in the death rate uh, as 
resistance to malarial drugs spread. Um, in fact, what happened was the opposite. From 2003, the number of people dying of malaria fell steeply and almost halved since that time. What happened in 2003 to reverse that increase? The answer is a very simple innovation. The, mos the, the insecticide treated mosquito net. So uh, the, uh, there were experiments done in the 1980s in Burkina Faso by French and Burkina Faso scientists to see how mosquitoes reacted to uh, impregnated bed, bed nets. And they found that if the bed net had uh, insecticide on it, mosquitoes were not only killed by it, but were also repelled by it. So they actually left the buildings. And they found that this was true even if there were holes in the mosquito net. So the point was that this would work even in the rough conditions of Africa where mosquito nets would not remain intact for very long. And in 2003, this technology was adopted by the Gates Foundation as one of its weapons against malaria in Africa. Uh, and it has been responsible for almost three quarters of the decline in malaria since then. Not, in, not a vaccine, not insecticides, not anti-malarial medications, but this one very simple technology, the mosquito net impregnated with insecticides. So it's a beautiful example of of a very simple innovation that uh, solves uh, a very difficult problem. Meanwhile, the number of people dying of famine uh, in the world was supposed to increase very dramatically in the 1970s and 1980s. People like Paul Ehrlich said that it didn't matter what we did, we would be bound to see millions and millions of people dying of starvation in the 1970s and 80s. What happened? Famine went extinct. It literally pretty well died out. It is now almost impossible to die of famine in the world. That may change this year because of the effect of the pandemic and because of the effect of locusts in Africa. But uh, in recent decades, there has been almost no famine in the world for the first time in history. The number of people dying in warfare has declined very steadily. We're living in an age of extraordinary peace. It doesn't feel like that. But there is no war in South America at the moment, no war in North America. Um, that's the first time there has been no war in the American hemisphere. And there are only about 10 wars happening in the old world, which may sound like a lot, but actually it's a record low number. The amount of oil spilled in the ocean, this was one of the worst environmental problems when I was young, has now declined very dramatically, thanks to innovations. Innovations in this case of double hulled tankers, and GPS satellite navigation. Those are what has meant that it's very difficult now to spill oil in the ocean, uh, or rather it's very easy not to. The thing that surprises people, I think, is that world inequality has been declining very rapidly. And that's because in the old days, there was a rich world and a poor world, a first world and a third world with a gap between them. Uh, whereas today, many people in poor countries have got richer, but people in rich countries have not got rich so fast. Uh, and so most people are now middle income uh, 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 people. Uh, and the brown line on this chart is, is Asia. Uh, and that shows very dramatically how uh, China and India have moved to the right on a chart like this, filling the gap between the rich and the poor. Surprisingly, uh, people are happier. Uh, because if you measure happiness, you find that it, there is a correlation with wealth both between countries, that's what the dots show, and within countries, that's what the little arrows show. So um, it's, as we get richer, we are making people less miserable and more happy. But even this underestimates the impact of technology and innovation on our life, um, because it doesn't take into account the effect of new technologies on our ability to live our lives and fulfill our needs. This is the price of lighting over centuries in England. Uh, a million lumen hours of light. How much money would you have to spend uh, in a, at a uh, fixed exchange rate to uh, achieve that much light? And the answer is almost nothing now, a huge amount in the past. So light was a very expensive luxury in the Middle Ages. It is now a very cheap necessity that everybody uh, relies upon. 
But even that underestimates the impact because it measures it in money instead of time. And I think the way you should measure these things is the amount of time it takes you to fulfill a need. If you want to switch on a lamp for an hour to read a book, preferably one of my books, uh, then uh, how long do you have to work on the average British wage to be able to afford that much light? And the answer is about a third of a second. You can't see that. It's behind the, the, the images, I think. Uh, in 1950, you would have had to work for eight seconds to earn that much light. Uh, in 1880, 15 minutes on the average wage. Uh, and in 1800, six hours. Six hours of work for one hour of light. I think most people could not afford candles uh, in 1800. So that gives you an idea of what an incredible change there has been uh, in the availability for a given amount of work of the kind of things that people wish to get hold of. Now, what I want to talk about is the main theme of my book, which is uh, stories about innovation, how innovations came about in order to try and understand how this process works uh, and how it can be encouraged because it has achieved so much good. And I'm going to run through 12 quick themes of what innovation can do and how it does, how, how it works. Um, I'm going to argue that it's very gradual. It doesn't ha happen in great big jumps. Uh, it's serendipitous. That means it's lucky. It's fortuitous. There's a lot of ac lucky accidents in, in the process of innovation. It's recombinant. That is to say, we combine different technologies to make new technologies. Uh, it's very different from invention. Innovation is the process of turning an invention into a practical and usable reality, which is often much harder than inventing the first prototype. Um, it, it involves a huge amount of trial and error. Um, it's a, a process of, of experimentation that is vital to it. It's a team sport. It's not true that individuals do this, uh, that people always have to collaborate. And there's something inexorable about it. Once it gets started, it builds upon itself. It causes uh, a certain amount of innovation, causes more innovation, and so it progresses forward under its own steam. I'm going to talk about something called the hype cycle, which is what I call the business by which we underestimate in the uh, long run how much effect an innovation will have, but we overestimate in the short run. So innovations are often disappointing to start with, but spectacular in the long run. I'm going to talk about how it likes fragmented government. It doesn't thrive in empires. Uh, it, it tends to enjoy times when countries are, have different policies so that inventors can move to different uh, areas. I'm going to talk about how it's an evolutionary process, how it, uh, it, 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 it progresses by natural selection, how it's the mother of science as well as the daughter of science, how the relationship goes two ways between science and technology, how it creates rather than destroys jobs, how it can save resources rather than use more resources, and why it flourishes in freedom. Let me talk about the gradual nature of innovation first. This is Moore's law, the decline in the cost of computing over time. And what's really interesting is that we normally talk about the history of computers and computing in terms of great breakthroughs, big changes that happened uh, in the technologies from the electromechanical relay to the vacuum tube to the resistor to the transistor to the integrated circuit. But if you look at it on a chart like this, you see no breakthroughs. You just see a gradual march towards better technology. And once Gordon Moore had identified his law in the 1960s, there should have been a, it should have been possible to jump ahead and get to the end quickly. But that didn't prove possible either. So there is something surprisingly gradual and incremental uh, about innovation. And this is true of nearly every technology you look at. Even, I would argue, the invention of the aeroplane. It looks like a very sudden thing. One day an aeroplane can't fly, the next day it can. But the closer you look, the more you find that they had been experimenting with gliders for several years. And in the days after, in the year or two after inventing the aeroplane, their flights were very short. Uh, and so there is very little difference. So it is a very gradual process. Innovation is ex characterized by serendipity. That is the posh word for luck. Um, 
uh, but luck which favors the prepared mind. Um, the scientists at 3M were looking for a strong glue and they found a weak glue instead, a temporary glue. And they thought that's useless. But one of their colleagues called Art Fry said, this is just what I need on the back of paper so that I can mark the place in my hymn book when I'm in church. And so was born the post-it note, which we all use every day. Um, Stephanie Quallick at DuPont was looking for something completely different when she came up with this extraordinarily strong substance called Kevlar and realized that it had potential, for example, in making bulletproof vests. So again and again, as I went through the stories of where innovation came from, I found these accidents, these lucky changes that had happened. Innovation is recombinant. And by that, I mean, just like biological evolution, it, it, what it does is it takes different ideas and puts them together in different forms. So nearly every technology that you possess is actually a combination of other technologies. And this is, as Aparicio said, uh, my idea that we should call this ideas having sex, because it's just like in biology, sex reshuffles genes and in technology, innovation shuffles technologies. The pill camera is something that was invented after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer over a garden fence. That's what I mean by ideas having sex. On my desk at home sits this object. It's an Ashwellian hand axe of the kind used by Homo erectus at least half a million years ago. And it's beautifully designed for the job it was to do, which was to slice up rhinoceroses or something like that. Um, uh, and right next to it sits an object of exactly the same size and shape. And I find this very moving because it reminds us how the human hand hasn't changed in half a million years and how connected we are to our ancestors. But there is a big difference. The hand axe is made from stone and it was made by one person and used by one person. Uh, the mouse is made from different substances, plastic and silicon and metal. Uh, it's made by me, but it was made for me by lots and lots and lots of different people. Hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people contributed to the making of this because you have to include the people growing coffee, whose coffee was drunk by the people drilling for oil, whose oil was used in the plastic factory, etc., etc. And I'm quoting here from a famous essay called I Pencil by Leonard Reed, in which a pencil tries to understand its own origins. And it comes to the conclusion that it is the result of millions of people collaborating. And the remarkable thing is that among these millions of people who collaborated in making a pencil, there was nobody who knew how to make a pencil. Not one of these people knew how to make a pencil. The knowledge was not stored inside an individual head. It was stored inside uh, between heads, but amongst heads, in the cloud, if you like, because the person in the factory assembling the pencil didn't know how to drill an oil well um, or uh, cut down a tree or mine graphite uh, or grow coffee. Uh, so uh, all these different things had to come together. Innovation is different from invention. This is a story that Charles Towns, the inventor of the laser, was very keen on telling. There's a beaver and a rabbit looking at the Hoover Dam. And the uh, beaver says to the rabbit, no, I didn't build it, but it's based on an idea of mine. <laughs> now, um, many, many scientists will often say, well, yeah, I invented, I, I had that idea and somebody else is making money out of it. Forgetting that actually a huge amount of the work in innovation is turning an idea into a practical proposition, into something that is uh, uh, cheap enough and uh, affordable enough and practical enough and sustainable enough to be used uh, throughout society. Innovation requires experimentation. Thomas Edison used 6,000 different plant materials uh, for the filament of his light bulbs before he settled on Japanese bamboo. He just went on looking and looking and looking till he could find something that had just the right physical characteristics to work as the filament of a light bulb. And that's what distinguished him as a 
uh, as an innovator is that he knew that it was about hard work. I have not failed, he said, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. He's also reputed to have said that innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And again and again, I found, as I told the stories of innovations that changed the world, that they, the, the main people involved emphasized the importance of um, trial and error. Innovation is a team sport. And what I mean by that is it requires lots of people. It's never an individual working on their own. Because even if you find a crucial individual who made a great breakthrough, you find that there is a long string of people behind him leading up to his breakthrough. And there is a long string of people after him or her uh, developing the breakthrough and turning it into something practical. So Norman Borlaug made an enormous difference to the world by inventing, by, by, by developing strains of dwarf wheat that could yield far higher when supplied with fertilizer, first in Mexico and then in India and Pakistan. And he basically started the Green Revolution, which resulted in the saving of millions of lives um, and the conquest of famine. So a great, great innovator. But if you look into it, you found that he got the idea of dwarf wheats from somebody called Burton Bales, who told him uh, about this, these new varieties. And he had got the idea by visiting somebody called Orville Vogel in Oregon, who was growing these varieties. And Orville Vogel had got them from someone called Cecil Salmon, who was in Japan at the end of the Second World War. And he visited an agricultural station and he collected these dwarf varieties of wheat. And those had been created or by a Japanese scientist called Gonjiro Inazuka, uh, who um, had done the crosses to produce this strain of wheat. And um, uh, he had even, we think, got it from Korea uh, many uh, decades before, or some of his predecessors had. So the, the origin of this uh, mutant wheat is lost in the mists of time, actually. But each person was important to the, to the uh, innovations. And Borlaug himself then uh, required the help of some very important people, particularly in India and Pakistan. M.S. Swaminathan in India was one of the most important ones in order to turn this into a practical technology that could help people uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Innovation is inexorable. I already mentioned this point that, uh, uh, that well, there's something sort of inevitable about um, some of the innovations we see. So 21 different people invented the light bulb independently of each other. There was In England, there was someone called Swan. In America, there was Edison and Max Deegan. And they all came up with similar designs. A glass bulb with a vacuum in it or nitrogen in it, a, a filament through which you passed a current. Why then? Why did everybody come up with the, the idea at the same time? Because it was ripe. Because the, the technologies that you needed to combine to do this had come had reached the point where it was inevitable that people would put them together. The technology of creating vacuums, the technology of growing, blowing glass, and the technology of electricity. Um, the same is true in the 1990s of search engines. Search engines were inevitable in the 1990s and it didn't matter whether Google was invented or not we would still have search engines today. Um, you couldn't get through the 1990s without search engines being invented and I argue that the search engine is as important as the steam engine uh, in the history of innovation. I'm very interested in this phenomenon. Roy Amara is a scientist, a computer scientist in the 1960s in California, who said that we underestimate the impact of a new technology in the long run, but we overestimate it in the short run. Uh, and so it's not a linear process, the adoption of a technology. It's much more like an S-shaped graph in which nothing much happens for the first 15 years. And then there is a rapid takeoff phase uh, of a new technology. Uh, and so often we're very disappointed in the early years of a technology. It is past the point where it's disappointing. It's no longer disappointing. It's already exceeding our expectations. 
in terms of its impact on the world. Genomics, after the sequencing of the human genome, was rather disappointing for a long time, didn't have as much impact on medicine as we thought, but is now beginning to show real promise. Some forms of artificial intelligence are still not achieving what we expect them to, uh, things like driverless cars, for example. And as for blockchain, well, it's hardly begun to disappoint us yet. But I suspect in 15 or 20 years' time, we will find that it makes a huge difference in the world. Empires are bad at innovation, whether it's in China or India or uh, British Empire or Roman Empire. Um, on the whole, they become centralized structures uh, which insist on trying to do things one way uh, and which allow uh, the incumbents industries to, to militate against change. Um, and this is my main complaint about the European Union. It is basically a sort of empire. It is trying to do things from the center and it has proved to be very bad at innovation. It's the reason we don't have uh, digital giants to rival Amazon and, and Google in, in Europe. It's the reason we have, we've been so very slow off the mark with genome editing compared with America and China. Um, so centralized regimes are not what you want. Europe's great success in the uh, early modern period was that it was fragmented. And so innovators could move to different countries to find a congenial regime. Um, uh, and China's great success in the Song Dynasty was similar. It, was, uh, it wasn't united. When it became united in the Ming Dynasty, uh, then its innovation fell off a cliff. The same is true of big companies. On the whole, most big companies do not innovate. They try and try and try, but they're very bad at it. The whole culture militates against it. Uh, some, like Amazon and Google, are, are sort of going to frantic efforts to keep innovation alive. They're setting up so-called skunk works. They're setting up structures so that new ideas are, are created within the organization. Uh, and these will work for a while, but if you look at Huge companies like Kodak, which was one of the biggest film company in the world, um, in the end just went bust because it didn't invent digital photography, or rather it did invent it, but it didn't want to destroy its own business, so it didn't develop it. And Nokia was the biggest mobile phone company in the world for a while, with an enormous budget for research and development, but uh, because it had such a dominance of voice telephony, it did not develop data and the smartphones that came along uh, meant that it ended up being very valueless. Innovation is an evolutionary process. I make the case that a lot of what we see in the world is natural selection, just like in Darwinism. So here's a quote from a, a, a French philosopher, uh, Emile Chartier. Uh, every boat is copied from another boat. Let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It's clear that a very badly made boat will go to the bottom after one or two voyages and thus never be copied. One could then say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself which chooses the boats, choosing those which function and destroying ones that don't. It's a really nice thought when you think about it. Every, you know, you go on an airplane, you think it was designed, but it wasn't designed. It was copied from a previous design with some changes and that was copied from a previous design and that was copied from a previous design all the way back to the um, Wright Brothers aeroplane. Now we tend, polit politicians tend to think that science is the, uh, the, the spring, is the start of the process and innovation is the end of the process, that, that we discover things with science, we apply them with technology, uh, and then we turn them into innovations of use to consumers. And this is very misleading. For, for decades, actually, people have been saying, no, 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 it doesn't work this way. Sometimes technology helps science along, sometimes science helps technology along. Uh, the, it is not the case that one is the other. And to give you uh, a, an example of that, the new technology of CRISPR genome editing was developed uh, uh, a key development was the work of this man, Philippe Horvath, who was working for the yogurt industry. He was not working in universities. He was not looking for new scientific ideas. He was trying to work out why bacteria get sick in yogurt cultures. Uh, and in doing so, he began to study the genes of these bacteria. And he discovered that a Spanish colleague 
uh, working in a university but for an industry had um, discovered some strange sequences that seemed to be the immune system of the bacteria and it turned out that you could repurpose these as a tool for genome editing in any species and that's the origin of CRISPR it comes out of the yogurt industry most many people think that the problem with innovation is that it destroys jobs automation leads to nothing for us to do but people have been complaining about this for 200 years and during that time the number of jobs just continues to increase not decrease uh, and that's because uh, what innovation does is it destroys some jobs and creates others uh, it creates other opportunities it enriches people so that they can employ people in other jobs that have not yet been thought of if you said to a victorian person in the future lots of people are going to be flight attendants and software engineers they would say i don't even understand those words i don't know what you mean innovation saves resources that is to say it's possible to particularly these days for an innovation to be something that uses less energy less steel less water and that's why you've invented it and that's why it's cheaper and that's why it's more affordable so for example uh, the amount of land needed to produce a given amount of food has declined by 68 percent since 1961 uh, freeing a lot of land to be returned to nature um, uh, and this is just an example there are plenty of others like using less steel in buildings and cars today than we did using less aluminium in uh, drinks cans than we used to do and innovation flourishes in freedom everywhere and always throughout history people have resisted innovation they have fought against it it's been true ever since prehistoric times let me give you an example in the 1500s or rather that's when it came from ethiopia to arabia and then into uh, the mediterranean and europe and wherever it went the ruler tried to ban it uh, whether this was in uh, istanbul where it was banned by several sultans or france uh, or here in england the um king uh, king charles in the 1670s banned coffee houses and he did so for two reasons one because uh, the uh, wine and beer industry didn't like this rival drink and they got the medics to say this coffee thing is bad for you it dry, dries up your blood and makes you um, uh, impotent and things like that and so it must be banned for that reason and the other reason of course was that coffee houses were a place where people would meet and talk about how the king was not doing a very good job and the king didn't like that so that was his reason for banning coffee houses but this is just an example the umbrella was resisted as an innovation because it meant that people walked instead of catching a cab in london um uh, also whenever an innovation comes along whether it's fracking or genome editing today or whether it's something simple in the past there are always vested interests trying to stop it so it's not true that we are addicted to innovation we are very resistant to innovation but it is possible for legislators to pass laws that actually encourage innovation and these are always ones that cause freedom a good example is the digital millennium copyright act uh, in the 1990s in america which was essentially the piece of legislation that enabled e-commerce to get started that made it possible for this explosion of online uh, business that happened because what it essentially did was it exempted the owners of websites from uh, uh, responsibility for the content of stuff appearing on their website so it made it much easier uh, for small businesses to start operating online and it was a deliberately libertarian piece of legislation passed by the clinton administration uh, which caused uh, e-commerce right well um what's next how do we solve uh, some of the problems of the world in particular uh, the uh, pandemic there is no question but that innovation will be the answer to this pandemic um, whether it's a vaccine or a drug uh, or a an app that allows us to do uh, 
the, to do tracing of contacts, um, uh, whatever it is, it's going to be an innovation. And we need to unleash the innovative power uh, of industry and uh, technology. And when you think about it, what's wrong with the pandemic to get going is a lack of innovation. It's shocking that vaccine development is still so slow, takes years, like it did 50 years ago, to produce a vaccine for a new pandemic. It's shocking that diagnostic testing has not been more innovative over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, and that antiviral therapies, in fact, antiviral therapies are better than they were because of Ebola, which led to a great deal of experimentation. Uh, and I actually am quite hopeful that some of these therapies in, in combination will work against coronavirus. But the world, if the world had had more innovation in these areas in the last 20 years, the pandemic would not be such a problem. What's next more generally? I don't know. And you shouldn't believe me if I say that I do know. Here are four really clever people making predictions about the future that were entirely wrong. Ernest Rutherford said in 1933 that it was impossible to do nuclear power. Uh, Ken Olson, the chairman of the biggest computer company in the world at the time, or the second biggest computer company in the world, uh, said in 1977 that there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Uh, and Paul Krugman, a brilliant economist, said in 1998 that by 2005 or so it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. Uh, and finally, uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, the chief executive of Microsoft, said there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any market share. Whoops. So if I say anything about the future, you better treat it as, 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 as useless as that. But there are some interesting patterns that one can see. This is a cartoon that appeared the year I was born. It's nothing to do with me, but anyway, that, that's how old it is. And it shows how they thought in the 1950s the world of today would look like. So you have a mailman delivering letters with a jetpack strapped to his back to speed him up. So there's no concept of email, but there's a really spectacular piece of transport technology which we don't have. And this reminds us that all the ideas from the 1950s, they're all about transport. They were all about personal gyrocopters, routine space travel, supersonic aircraft, all these kind of things we don't have. And there's nothing about the internet. There's almost nothing about computers. They had just lived through 50 years of incredible changes in transport and almost no changes in communication. We have just lived through the opposite. 50 years of extraordinary changes in communication and almost no changes in transport. I flew on a 747 last year. That's a 50-year-old design of aeroplane. Um, so it's quite extraordinary when you think about it, how little change there has been in some technologies and how much in others. And therefore, the next 50 years may not be about computing. They may be about something else. We may run out of steam in the digital uh, innovation area. By the way, just to uh, pay lip service to what we're doing right now, which is communicating and be able to see each other, here is a beautiful prediction that got things exactly right from a telephone executive uh, in uh, California in 1953. He says, just what form the future of the telephone will take is of course pure speculation. Here is my prophecy. In its final development, the telephone will be carried about by the individual. Here it is, carrying it about. Perhaps as we carry a watch today. Indeed, he saw the idea of wearables. It probably will require no dial or equivalent. And I think users will be able to see each other if they want as they talk. And here we are doing exactly that. So ladies and gentlemen, in this terrible time when we face economic catastrophe on top of a health disaster, it's worth reminding ourselves that the world has got through much greater problems in the past and that we live in extraordinary times when the real average uh, income of the average person has never been so high and has never gone up so fast. And that back even 150 years ago, people were already complaining then about how it couldn't go on, it had to come to an end. 
this is the historian Thomas Babington Macaulay saying, we cannot absolutely prove that those are in error who say society has reached a turning point that we've seen our best days, but so said all who came before us and with just as much apparent reason. On what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? So even then he was fed up with people saying it can't get any better, and yet it had hardly got better at that stage. So the future can be very bright indeed. Thank you very much indeed, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ridley, for that incredible presentation and conference. It's, it's so good for us to see what we have, much of what we have learned in your books and what we're expecting for your next book. Just to remind you, you have uh, Mr. Ridley's book in Amazon, books such as this, which are really, we have here and they, and they and here's and, the new one. <laughs> and he has a new one. He's coming this month. About next month. May. Next month. Next I month already, in, Amer in America and then June in, in the UK. I already reserved it in Amazon, the, the Kindle version. So I, I encourage you to do the same because they're really good books. These books and what he has said, he, I mean, Mr. Ridley is part of what people is getting, it, it now calls a rational optimist. People who is against the, 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 the people who want, who wants to be the prophets of dystopia and says the world is worse than ever before. So, so I think it's really important to see how we have, we have uh, progressed so much and the reason we have, we have, we have, we have done that as, as, a human, as human beings. So we're gonna start with, with, the, with the questions. I have the first question was made by pa Pamela Icaza. She's, a, she's an Ecuadorian studying in, in London Oh, hi, Pamela. Work in Ecuador Libre. She's now in London. She says, it is possible to teach how to innovate. Do you think it is possible or desirable to include it in the education curriculum? I think it's desirable to include the importance of innovation in the education curriculum, yes. To remind people of what, it, what innovation has done and why they shouldn't be automatically against it. But I don't think you can teach people to be educated, to be sorry, to be innovators, because we don't know enough of how to do it. It depends too much on lucky accidents, etc. So I, I don't recommend the training of innovators in schools, because I think we would train them in the wrong things, um, possibly. Um, uh, that said, I'm very interested by the fact that Thomas Edison. Um, did set out to produce innovation as a product. In other words, he didn't say, I'm going to in invent this one thing or that one thing. He said, I'm going to do general invention in lots of areas. That's going to be my job is inventing things. And there are not enough people who do that these days. And it would be lovely if the next generation would do that. Awesome. I'm going to mix two questions, which are much more the same, from Bernardo Meissner and from Antonio Alvarez. They say, they ask, what do you think about pay patents and copyrights? And do you think they halt innovation or they foster innovation? What about the evergreening practices, for example, in drugs development and investigation? Sorry, what was that last bit? What about the ev evergreen practices for example in drug development and investigation okay in drug development yes the, i missed the word drug um uh, uh i am skeptical about patents and copyrights about intellectual property generally i think it uh the evidence i have seen from the stories i tell in my new book uh very much support the idea that it is uh, hindering innovation more than it is helping you get um, patents that stop other people developing ideas but are not used themselves. These are called patent trolls. Uh, you get uh, people tr making money out of the patent rather than using it to advance technology. Um, uh, it becomes a form of rent seeking, uh, uh, as it were. Um, and an awful lot of inventors I discovered in researching the history of innovation having made brilliant in inventions like the airplane or the radio in the case of Marconi or um, the telegraph in the case of Samuel Morse, then spent decades in court 
fighting to assert their patents uh, and 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 the patent doesn't reflect this process of team uh, of, of a team sport because the the people they were fighting against in court often had a good argument to make well i invented half of this um how come you're getting all the money and they would say no i invented it all well it's never all or nothing it's always uh, th they destroy collaboration is my argument so um uh, and and the international comparisons between countries that have strong patent systems and countries that don't between what the the, the stories of what happens when you buy out a patent um, or when a patent expires and you get a flourishing of innovation so the french bought out daguerre's patent on photography uh, so that it wouldn't get in the way of other people developing photography the government bought it out uh, and that had an enormous impact one of the things we should be doing now to encourage vaccine development is going and buying out patents uh, on behalf of uh, governments uh, or and doing so in the form of future contracts you know saying look we'll give you money to um uh, uh sort of future market share contracts so um uh, i'm uh, i think patents are too long too restrictive uh, too easy to get uh, and that we need to to have much more gradations of of patents that are easy to get but very short patents that are difficult to get and very long the one area where it's difficult to see how one could abolish them altogether is drug development because if it takes a billion dollars to prove that a drug is safe and effective then you can't imagine that anybody would buy or sell a, 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 a drug uh, profitably if generic competitors could come in immediately after you've developed it um, uh, but even there if you look at what the drug companies do with their monopoly profits out of blockbuster drugs they spend them on marketing they don't spend them on research largely so um now as a book writer i uh, earn money from copyright um but again if you look at what happened in the music industry where copyright was effectively destroyed uh did that destroy creativity in music no lots of people still being musicians uh, they had to go out and do more live gigs and they weren't able to sit back and let the money roll in from cd sales to the same extent um, uh, but i mean i have 70 years of copyright on this book 70 years after my death you know if i live another 20 years then it's 90 years from now that that, that somebody my my grandchildren will still be getting money from that book they should get a job instead not that the, I'm going to make that much money, you understand. It's not that profitable. <laughs> so that's my view on patents and copyrights. We've gone too far. They're getting in the way of innovation. Mr. Ridley, just coming back to the first question, there's, there's something that I want, always wanted to, to, to ask you. In your books, in all of them, you talk about some concepts which are not really present in normal education, which is concepts such as a spontaneous order, social evolution cultural evolution they don't teach us that they, they don't they, they don't tell they don't tell us how society works in reality so what do you think about that do we need to 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 get to to include all these concepts developed by you know better than i but adam smith hayek and, and yourselves is that important to to get people to know how it works how the world works really yes i think very very strongly you're right about that and if i take myself as an example i never read adam smith i was never told about him i never read hayek uh the, the, all these ideas about spontaneous order i discovered as an adult i didn't get them from school or university um and that's pretty shocking when you think how fundamental they are to our understanding of how the world works uh today um uh, and if there is one recommendation I make to children, uh, often, I often say, please read I Pencil. It's a very short essay uh, and therefore very easy for people to, you know, try at least. 
it's very entertaining it's it and it it just gives you this whole new way of seeing the world um that of course when you think about it lots of people contribute to the making of a pencil and then hang on none of them know how to make a pencil it's a really just so delightful way of getting across the, a very simple concept so if i had one wish it would be to send that little essay to every classroom in the world that's really good advice eliana she asks how non-technology oh, sorry how non-technological innovation such as organizational and marketing should work in this moment of pandemic should 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 it re reinvent yours itself perhaps the use of industry 4.0 is urgently required in all process of the value chain completely agree i think it's a really good point and look we're doing it now you and i are uh, discovering that uh, we don't need to be in the same room uh, in order to have a really interesting i mean the chances that i would be able to travel to ecuador with my schedule to give a seminar um we're always going to be very small um but uh i had never used zoom until a few weeks ago i had never used microsoft teams until a few weeks ago i'd used skype uh, but i didn't i'd never done virtual meetings i'm now completely familiar with them this is the first time i've shared slides on a screen thank you for teaching me that it turned out to be very very easy yesterday i took part i sit in the House of Lords in the British Parliament. Yesterday, I took part in a parliamentary session uh, um, online. I didn't actually say anything, but I watched the debate. I'm going to be making a speech next week online. It was a little difficult. Some of my colleagues didn't know about the mute button. <laughs> so you could hear their wife making coffee in the background. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, you know, I, this has to change the world, doesn't it? I mean, surely after this, I know lots of people who are saying, I'm not going to make an effort to go to meetings. I'm going to join the meetings virtually. Um, and 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been the same because the quality of broadband uh, and the quality of software was just not there. So if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, I don't think we'd be able to, 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 to make such use. So that's a good example. Sorry, that is a technological change, I suppose, rather than a, a, you asked for organizational changes. Um, uh, and uh, yes, I hope there will be organizational changes uh, as a result of this. And I think the fact that we are going to have to develop social distancing. Well, here's a very simple example. I've never liked the fact that we shake hands. It's obviously a way of passing on viruses. And uh, I had a cold in January. It wasn't COVID-19, but I decided that during this period of this cold, I would never shake anybody's hand. And it was very difficult. I kept forgetting and I was halfway out with my hand and I was about to shake them. And then I would turn and give them the elbow and they, and people were sometimes quite sort of upset about this. They said, well, what's the matter? Why don't you want to shake my hand? You know, and I would say, cause I've got a cold, I don't want to give it to you. And so this cultural innovation of, I would like to see a cultural innovation where we don't shake hands. We bump elbows forever from now on. Let's, here and now, you, you and me, uh, uh, Aparicio and I are inventing this, and we're going to write an article together saying this is how the world should be. How about that? Great. I'm going mean, to. We'll, uh, we'll have to stop the French kissing, of course. But, you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're going to write an article. Stop shaking your hands. Yeah. Now, that's going to. That's. That, I, I'm fully in it. Totally. I'm, I, we have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sorry if I let in so, someone, someone in the in, in the in the behind. Do you think people, especially from the right wing political spectrum, is saying that they, this is the end of the globalizing uh, ideology? This is the end of globalization. We should think better. Globalization, as we know, it is going to end. What do you think of that? Is 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 this a back, backlash? Is this crisis a backlash for globalization, or we're we gonna go through like normally after this? I think this is a very big danger. Uh, I think a lot of people want to say we must be more nationalistic, we must be more self-sufficient, we must grow our own food uh, for future pandemic risk, etc. I think that's the wrong answer because the you know just think about it. If let's say uh, the Taiwanese invent a vaccine that works tomorrow. 
do we want to say no nope, that's taiwanese so we're not going to have it <laughs> of course not we're going to say please can we buy your vaccine uh, and if th that is true of a vaccine it should be true of anything so i think this pandemic should tell us that we are uh that we need international trade and international uh, movement of ideas and people as much as ever uh, but i fear that there will be the, the nationalists on the right who particularly uh, in america where they uh, don't like free trade um uh well donald trump doesn't like free trade will be empowered by this and i think it's very important for liberals um for people who appreciate freedom to try and make the the arguments back great answer thank you we have time for two more questions uh what do you think how innovation what is the problem in your research, as a result of your research, what is the main problem, main obstacle for innovation in Latin American countries, and normally in underdeveloped countries? What, what, what is, you, do you think, the, the worst institution, institutional barrier we have to defeat to get innovation to work? I don't know Latin American countries well enough to give you a, an answer on that. You know them better than me, and I would probably turn the question around and ask you. Um, but I am uh, somewhat persuaded by Hernando de Soto's arguments that um, uh, property rights are not sufficiently respected in many Latin American countries, um, uh, uh, that um, that the... the um, the, the 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 traditions of free contract exchange as opposed to sort of status based relations uh, are not quite strong enough that said um i don't think uh, you know i mean latin america has seen some spectacular improvements in living standards um not quite as fast as asia but in some countries jolly nearly uh, in recent years so uh, I think many countries can go in the right direction, um, uh, but it it feels like you have slightly too much government and not enough individual rights uh, looking from outside. Um, uh, uh, and that a country like Chile has done best and a country like Venezuela has done worst. But I would be more interested to know what you how you would answer that question. <laughs> This is your conference. This is your conference right now. <laughs> next time. Next time. Well, we agree on much of this. Uh, this, you, you know, that as you will say in your next book, is the innovation only flourishes in uh, in freedom. So I think this is uh, much general. I will have to read your book before 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 I try to answer that. But um, just one final question, which I think summarizes. Uh, what people really like worrying about right now. What do you think would be the outcome of this crisis? And um, what if you're, if you have to give some advice for people, many of the, the people who is in this conference is people who is close to policymakers or is part of the public debate in Ecuador. What would you think it would be the, the, the way out of this crisis? And what would you recommend us to have in mind to 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 go uh, to build our our way out of of this to 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 prosperity again. Uh, I think in the short run, transparency and sharing of information is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, uh, that's what's going to help keep people on side for the measures necess necessary. In the long run, to restore prosperity after the terrible recession that is undoubtedly coming. Um, uh, I would be saying to a policymaker, please, 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 can we sit down and look at every regulation that is getting in the way of innovation, getting in the way of uh, people investing in new products, new processes, uh, building new buildings, whatever it might be. Um, because um, we, in order to speed up vaccine development, uh, uh, we are stripping away regulation, saying, no, 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 we don't worry about that. You know, we must rush this through. And no, it doesn't need to take 12 months to take that decision. We can do it in three days. 
Well, if we do that for medications, then let's do that for the whole economy. And I have come to the conclusion, grappling with bureaucratic systems in Britain, that the real enemy is slow decision making, that it's the lack of urgency in the bureaucracy that is the real problem uh, uh, in the world. It's not the fact that bureaucrats say no, they, on the whole, they don't say no. They just take a very, very long time to say yes. Um, and to give you an example, um, in my book written before the epidemic began, uh, I talk about how long it takes to get a new medical device licensed in different countries. And this could be a diagnostic test, a DNA test or an antibody test. And if I had invented one of those in Germany, it would have taken me 70 months to get approval from the regulator to put that on the market. In America, 20 months. Now, how many people in Germany thought, I'm not going to bother, I can't wait um, three years for approval for this, I'm going to go and um, uh, uh, you know, sail my yacht or um, uh, invent something else instead. And so diagnostic medical devices did not get invented because of the slow decision making. And it can't possibly take three years to decide whether something is safe. It, it, we know because we know, we're doing it now that it takes three days to find if something is safe. So I think to, to speed up the decision making of government is the one thing that politicians should be focusing on. And that's what I will be telling my colleagues um, in Parliament next week. Great, Mr. Ridley. Mr. Ridley, uh, if I have to put a headline on, on this final intervention, I will say like the problem with bureaucracy is that it takes too long to say yes. And then yes. make a, a headline of what we have to do here because it does de describe what is happening in, in Ecuador right now it will, and what we need to to look up to. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You, 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 this means a lot for us uh, to have a person like you. We admire so much. Um, thanks for your time. We're, we're going to invite you to Ecuador someday when this happens. And we're not going to shake hands, but we're going to have you. <laughs> we're going to have you. We're just gonna have our elbow. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Really pleasure to have you here. Um, we hope this is going to be broadcasted. It's going to be recorded and subtitled in Spanish, and it's going to be available. We're going to send you all the all the Fantastic. records. I will put it on social media, and I'm most grateful to you. And uh, uh, thank you for the invitation, and very good luck. Um, uh, and to all my friends in Ecuador now, um, I hope it all goes well. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Ridley. So see you then. See you all. Thank you hey. for all the people who stay here. Bye-bye.